All right. Uh, hi, I'm Brian. Um, today I'm going to present a little bit about uh, Erlang on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, my background just a little bit is that I sort of a software developer. I've always had interest in Erlang. I never really had a chance to use it um, because it's like typically used for like just massive distributed systems and databases and things that like it was. I'll get into it, but yeah. So basically, I never really had a chance to use it in like for commercial reasons or like for work. Uh, but I always kind of liked it. So um, I heard about this project using Erlang on embedded systems for the BeagleBone Raspberry Pi, and I figured, well, this seems like a, a great way to kind of actually do some Erlang programming, get to know the language a little bit, and then explore the Raspberry Pi and, and embedded systems. So that's what I'm going to try to I hope to cover today is kind of just you'll get an introduction into to Erlang, uh, just in kind of how may might apply it in the context of Raspberry Pi. Uh, and then I'll give you some resources and things and show you kind of how I modeled some of the stuff in, in the Raspberry Pi uh, and how, how you can actually kind of connect these things together. OK. Um, so some context. Which I, so basically, I feel like you guys all probably know like this is the, the progression of things, right? So from mainframe, desktop, laptop, smartphone, tablet, up to now, everything's getting kind of smaller and more diverse ecosystem of devices and things. Uh, and then so I feel like going forward, it seems like there's this kind of this question mark in the upper right-hand corner, right? That's, that's kind of where we are now. And maybe going forward, I, you know, I see the progression of the ecosystem of things that run, you know, Linux. Just it's going to increase. It's going to be a more variety of devices. Um, and what I kind of think is happening, and it seems like it, just based on, you know, a lot of products that are coming out, is this idea of this. And I think we had a presenter here a couple weeks ago with this, the quantified self, right? This is like. You know, people measuring stuff about their how much they walk, how much they sleep. Um, I kind of put on the screen sort of. It's actually more of like becoming quantified life because you know you kind of have all these things that capture not necessarily like that are attached to you and your on your person, but then can like live in your environment and sense in your environment. Um, so like for example, there's like the Nike Fit fuel band, which is and the Fitbit. Um, like those are measuring personal sort of. At workout goals, the the we things body scale is like a, a Wi-Fi sca scale that like you know will send to the internet how much you weigh. Ninja Blocks is like a platform where you can kind of connect door sensors and light sensors and stuff. It was like I think a Kickstarter a few months ago. You can you can now buy Ninja Blocks that's actually based on the BeagleBone Blown, Beagle Blown, uh, processor uh, board. Smart things like all these like you know Spark Spark Core was the other cool one that just came out recently. Well, that's that's Arduino based, I believe, but still that, in that same kind of space. It's like have all these devices, kind of all connecting to the Wi-Fi network in your house or wherever you are, and sending data somewhere, right? Um, so it kind of is the making of the Internet of Things like, that people always are talking about, you know. Um, and it's kind of we have these different areas where these devices kind of fit into, whether it's health or security or measuring your environment or maybe just giving you information. You know, there's that. The, the little uh, Philips Hue light down there in the left, or the <laughs> blink, where like you can basically set it up to you know turn the lights red when there's traffic, uh, or you know your server's down, or whatever you want it to do. Like so, basically information. Um, where I haven't seen a whole lot of is in games, which is uh, kind of interesting to me. Um, I think that probably maybe it'll be once there's a more established platform for connecting things to the internet, uh, you'll start seeing. More types of, I mean, besides like the Xbox, you know, we're like those kind of platforms. I meant like physical computing platforms that are enter for entertainment purposes only. Um, so anyway, so these are all basically devices that are connected to each other that serve human needs, right? Our needs. Okay. So what does this have to do with Erlang? Well, um, I think that like the Internet of Things kind of has some shared history with Erlang. Um, so Erlang, so the Internet, right? So so on the left we have kind of got the Internet. Uh, it's got, and you know, with all these embedded systems, lots of little devices, plus Linux equals, you know, lots of internet-connected Linux-powered small, cheap embedded devices, right? So just a ton of those in your environment. On the right, sort of, is like the history of Erlang, right? So it's, it started with the phone network, um, and add lots of telco devices, then add Erlang, and then you get a massively scalable fault-tolerant system which runs on embedded systems. Um, so but that doesn't really explain what Erlang is. So right, so it's a language, right? Uh, it's a general purpose concurrent programming language um, and runtime system. It's functional. It has strict evaluation, single assignment, and dynamic typing. 
It was uh, originally created by Ericsson. It's why it's called Erlang for Ericsson language. Um, it was designed to be, you know, run on these giant telco switches and some kind of sometimes embedded telco switches, like wherever uh, you would put a telco switch, a closet, a hole in the ground, wherever, and then just basically run, be hot code swappable, be real time, it's well soft real time they call it, um, and basically run nonstop, right, and just never fail. Uh, so basically, they built this language where in Erlang you can create and destroy processes very fast sending messages, so I guess I probably should give you some context, so <laughs> I'm jumping ahead. So Merlang is all process based. Um, there are no classes or function or modules or uh, objects and things like that. There is no, um, so it's very different than your like normal programming language, right? So it's all process based. So it's designed to create and destroy these processes very fast. Um, sending messages between them is very quick. They all operate the same way. So you have an Erlang VM that runs in all the environments where you want to run Erlang, just like a Java VM. And then so on top of that, there's this abstraction layer in the language for creating and running and monitoring these processes that you create for your programs. Um, you can have thousands, hundreds of thousands of processes running on these boxes. Um, you can take advantage of multiple cores, you know, split, split up your processes running across multiple cores. The Erlang VM takes care of all that for you. The, um, each process has no shared memory. They're completely independent. So like you can't crash another process from one process. Uh, well, okay. At least not from accessing memory. I mean, you can still send, if you don't have your code architected properly, you can send some garbage to it and it'll crash. But one of the, the tenets of Erlang is you should fail quickly and then just restart your process. So if you ever have a process that is running and it receives a message that, I'm sorry, your question? When you say process, should I think of it as a thread so I can have multiple simultaneous yeah, so that's the idea. It's, it's this process is very ambiguous. Yeah. It's uh, really lightweight, though. Way more light, light, lightweight than a normal thread. I think they're called green threads. Yeah, green threads. So very lightweight, um, very quick to start up and kill. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we're in profession. Because you said with, like, you, 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 gave, you gave it a runtime like a JVM, but like with JVMs, you have processes Java and then on top of that there's all this stuff so what you're saying is that each process is essentially like like you said a green thread but on a single Erlang process running at the operating system level or, or is it actually like it, lots of little Erlang processes yeah you basically create lots of little Erlang I mean when you start up the Erlang environment you get you can start with one or you can start I mean you can start zero or no zero or as many as you want um, and then on top of that you run your your program and th your program will define how many processes but, you're going to run and, the and manage. The process has two meanings here depending on context. Yeah. And the context that we're interested in right now is is Erlang and its uh, environment. There is the sense of process in OS like PS, you know, PS mm -hmm. dash A that you get, but we're not talking about that at all in no. the conversation. No. No. Right. I mean, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll ho <laughs> hopefully, I'll, I'll have more pictures, so at least you can look at those and then ask questions about those. Um, so, like, what does Erlang look like? So, this is what Erlang code looks like. You, this is. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show this code later. It's part of what my my demo is made up of. It's a a single file where I define a module. So all all the all the functions are grouped inside modules. And then inside that module, I export several different methods that there's actually a couple that are I didn't show here, but so I export sort of that's the interface to the world, and I the slash after the name of the method is how is the uh, how many parameters it accepts, and then you can see like I've defined I don't have my mouse uh, the couple is a, is the name of a function and it accepts um, uh, an attribute, and then in that uh, I do some stuff <laughs> which I'll get to later. Uh, and then I define also another function switch, which takes two uh, attributes. Um, okay, so there's actually quite a lot to explain in here, but hmm. the demo I think will make it a little more clear. But basically, why can't I have a mouse? Nope. All right. Uh, I mean, it's just not showing up on the screen. That's all I meant. Yeah, I was hoping to highlight stuff. Uh, all right, so 
One thing you should know about Erlang is that uh, variables all start with an uppercase letter. That's just how they're, that's just the convention. Um, and then everything that starts with a lowercase, well, that's not, so you can, functions have to start with a lowercase, and then atoms, which are like symbols in Ruby or um, like other languages have that kind of construct. Uh, there are some keywords like receive. Um, I'll go into how that works later, but that's sort of part of um, the message passing between the processes, which I talked about a few minutes ago. And I'll get into that. So um, that's kind of what it looks like, just to give you a little bit of context. So compared to other languages, it's kind of, you know, like I said, process oriented. So if we compare it to Ruby, <laughs> we can have on the left here a definition of a class, which is our class foo. And I'm going to define inside that a method bar, and I'm just going to print hello. So on the right side, that's how you would do it in Erlang. So you'd have a file which had, uh, you define a module foo, and you export bar, and then bar is going to then return, which is basically print out using IO format, uh, which is a Erlang system um, method, and then print hello. So on the bottom, this is how you would use it. So in Ruby, I would do f equals foo.new, which would instantiate a, an instance version of my class foo. And then on that instance, I would call bar, and it would return hello. Uh, in Erlang, uh, you can do it two ways. So I can either call it, I guess in Ruby there's a similar idiom like calling a class method. This is kind of like a module method, the top one. So I'm just calling, and then inside that module, I'm calling the bar function and it's going to print out hello. I can also spawn, which is kind of like creating an instance. Um, I can spawn a process that contains that module and then I assign it to F and then I can I basically, when you spawn, you specify the, the name of the module, so I specified it as foo, and then bar is the, the method I want to, or the function I want to call when I spawn that process. So it's like to, to kick. Uh, yeah. Well, let's see. That's a good question. Um, I think so, because it returns a PID. So every time you call spawn, it's a process identifier, returns a PID. So I'm sure that PID will just hang out there until I kill it. So yeah, I suppose. Uh, but it doesn't really do much because I just have bar. And, you know, a lot of times you'd have bar. You have like basically like a start method in your, or sorry, start function in your module, and then that would then call like a loop function, and then that function would just kind of like continually do use tail recursion to keep calling itself. So that's typically what you would see in sort of this. And I'll get to that. You'll see that in in the code sample. Um, but this was just sort of like a very basic uh, comparison. Um, all right, so. Uh, so, how, well, so how is it used, right? So, uh, hmm. so basically, wh what I was going to demo, demo today, and this is actually jumping quite a, f a bit ahead conceptually, but what I was going to show today and what I wanted to demo was using uh, Erlang to toggle uh, just the hello world of embedded systems, toggle an LED on my uh, Raspberry Pi uh, over the internet. Um, so that would be actually kind of complex if you're trying to do that like in Ruby or Python or C or anything like that. You have to worry about like sockets and protocols and stuff, but the Erlang VM kind of, the Erlang handles that all for you. So what I'm going to do is on my laptop spin up Erlang VM, bring the, the shell, and in that shell I'm going to uh, spawn a process that's going to uh, sit up there on the top on my laptop. And then in Raspberry Pi I'm also going to uh, start up the Erlang shell there and start another process that's going to sit and kind of listen. So basically I'm going to create the laptop is going to act, uh, in the case of this LED, it's going to act like a switch and then the LED is going to act like an LED, but it's be like a remote switch you might have over the internet. Um, so th this is the kind of, the, I guess, the framework. So the Erlang VM actually will handle all of the connecting of the two, the, they're called nodes in Erlang terms. So if the node of the laptop and the little, node of the Raspberry Pi, the Erlang will be able, I'll just, with a couple, with one, pretty much one line, pretty much just I have to tell them about each other using uh, a name and an IP, they will uh, know how to talk to each other. Uh, all right. So uh, here's the demo. Oops. All right. So this is the the code that I'm going to run, and uh, I'll try to walk through it. This is um, available as a just if you want to play around with it. A, a lot of this stuff I got 
from there's a really great site that there's actually not a lot of people doing embedded Erlang stuff, but this one group out of Erlang Solutions, uh, I forget where they're from, but they have, okay, right? yeah, Omer, Omer yeah. Um, but he's been doing a lot of work. I emailed him to ask him about stuff, but like, yeah. Is, it, is, is, is um, Ericsson like the Western Electric of the UK? Uh, <laughs> it's Scandinavian. Yeah, it's not UK. It's not a UK company. I thought they were Swedish, yeah. yeah. All, all the ETL Decatrons I have say made in England. Um, actually, let me take a slow, so before I get into my code, let me, let me show you, I guess, so, I guess if you guys have, are you do you have any questions before I jump into code? Are you breakpointer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's me. Um, so, oh, what question? No? Okay. Like yeah. If you communicate over TCP, like UDP port or a TCP port, or, I mean, what's listening on the Raspberry? I mean, if you're going to hit via T, uh, IP, you have to have a port that's mm -hmm. listening. It's UDP, TCP, or, uh, port you know, or that's a well known a, port number? That's or? a good question. Uh, I don't know how you're going to. Basically, how do they find each yeah, well, other? Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Well, well, there's always something listening when I'm communicating via TCP or UDP on the other end. So that's, okay. That's why I don't understand. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's you. TCP, but I have to look that up. I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I was to know the ports if you were going through like a firewall. Firewall. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I, I'm sorry, I had one quick question. Are, is the idea, not to harp on the JVM, but is the concept with the, the way Erlang works, you said on the slide that it works identically in all environments, is that you can presumably have, does Erlang have like the concept of libraries? Like, is the environment identical in every way? Oh, no. Across? You can load libraries okay, in okay, different okay. ways. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, you would actually just import them, just you know, like you would other languages. Um, okay, so basically, the this guy I borrowed this code from. Uh, what was his name again? Omer. O Omer. Omer. Yeah. 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 Right. Omer. Right. So he wrote sort of this demo for driving a single LED with Erlang. So it basically uses SysFS. So um, you know, you if you want the LED to turn on, you're gonna write one to the pin. If you want to turn off, you're gonna write zero. Uh, there's a GPI. Let me open up the GPI module. But it looks kind of it looks like very familiar how you would probably do it in like other languages that are using SysFS as the interface. Um, Can I ask a yeah. What, what operating system are you running on the Pi right now? It's uh, Raspbian. Oh, okay. So you're yeah. Erlang is on, on the PC and then... Also Erlang on here. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'll, I, I'll show you how to... There's a, a package you can download. Okay. And you can set it up and run it on the, on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so you can see, here's the, actually the library that I'm going to use that basically does kind of, you know, what you've probably done if you do it by hand, basically. Uh, opens and then you put in the pin and it kind of sets a direction or a value. Um, so that's what's being called... It's just basically writing to that. Let me go back one more. Um, you know, when it when I do that, so right, it's just right into the SysFS line. All right, so let me. Oh crap! Nope, didn't want to do that. We could do like a net stat on the Raspberry Pi to try to catch the established port with the IP number, grab on the IP number. All right. Let's while while it's, if you can catch it right at that instant when you're trying to light the light, if that makes net sense. Net stat. You know what I mean? That's what I would do. All right. Uh, should I grep for something? Well, you, got, you have to know the source IP number and the Raspberry that's going to be trying to communicate with it. Uh, well, that, that would be my know. laptop. So yeah. it's uh, 10.100.1. Uh, yeah. uh, so then I don't know how to use Netstat. So oh, no, Netstat minus AN will tell you everything. Uh, else. And you got to do a grep. Don't, yeah, don't. Minus AN. Just do minus AN and return. Just hit return. Okay. That's good. Well, um, Oh, and then it's at the top. More, more. You'll see oh, scroll. the ports that are listening. Oop. See, I mean, you. It should come up as established in the IP number. Ah, you, okay. You know the port number. You know what I mean? Gotcha. All I right. Mean, it, so it might be irrelevant for, for the demonstration, but I was just curious how it's. Yeah, it, I actually don't know. Um, so nothing yet. Uh, right. Assuming I'm gripping, right? Yep. Um, all right. So let's. So um, uh, on the left here is the Raspberry Pi, and the right is my computer. I'm already SSH'd into the Raspberry Pi, and 
So um, let me just run the shell. Um, so yeah, let me just show you this part first. So it's so I'm gonna I want to turn the light on, All right? So I'm gonna do this SSH into the Raspberry Pi and um, call the LED driver directly. Um, so I'm going to call it as a module. So I'm going to do LED start. And I put it on pin 27. So if we go back over the code, um, what I'm doing is calling this method and passing in the pin as a variable. Uh, and it's going to initialize that pin using that, you know, so you basically set it up as out using sysfs. And then it's going to spawn uh, a, a copy of itself, this, of this module. It's going to then call the loop function, which is down here. And then in here, it's going to pass in the, the file and the PID, right? So it's going to call, see, basically, with this spawn method, it's going to spawn a separate process, just like we had in that other diagram, which is back, back, oh, here, right? So I uh, need a pointer. Anyway, process on the left is going to spawn the one on the right. And it's going to listen. It's going to loop. Um, and if we go back here, so it's going to call loop, which is here. And then it's going to sit in this receive loop, basically a receive block. Um, let's see if I, because, OK. What it does is receive is a Erlang uh, built in, whatever you call them, uh, name function. And basically, what receive does, it says, Every process has a um, what's called a mailbox. So when you when pr two processes talk to each other, they're sending messages back and forth, and the messages get queued up in a process mailbox. So when I call receive here, it's going to go to that mailbox and then try and pull out whatever is on top of that queue, um, and then it's going to try to match the message. So it's going to say, okay, did I get an on or an off? Did I get this tuple structure where it says blink and then a delay of the blink? Or did I get stopped? So these are these are atoms. These are like symbols that we use. And so with this loop function is it's kind of it receiving these messages and it's expecting with one of these things, right? Uh, one of these atoms to pass through. So that's what I'm going to do over here in the terminal. Is so I've started my uh, LED and I've named it a variable L, and there it is. It spawned up a process. So there's the PID for the process. So if I want to send a message to that process and you know actually call this. Um, so basically, so it's called spawn with loop. So I'm sitting here right now with my process, and it's sitting in this receive block. So I don't know if you guys, I'll call it and then take a look over at the light. So what I'll do is I'll just say, I'll just send it a message. So in Erlang, you to send a message is the, the, the exclamation point. Um, and there it is. It, I said turn it on, and it turned it on. Uh, they're very simple. So I said turn off, and it turned it off. Um, now, if I want to get fancy and say, you know, blink, we can go with that other blink construct we said. Uh, it was passing in a tuple, so it was, that's just like a struct, where it's like a, you know, hash in other languages, that kind of thing. So I'll say blink, uh, and I'll pass in in milliseconds oops, uh, how long I want it to blink, and then I'll call that, and you can see it's over here uh, blinking away. So if I want it to stop, I can say stop, and it's off. All right. So that's kind of how you control this little light with Erlang. So the next step is to actually set up my, the remote light and switch scenario that I was talking about. So for that, I wrote uh, this little. That was an SSH okay. session. Yeah, so that was SSH. I was SSH'd in right with the box, uh, right on the Raspberry Pi, running Erlang directly and directly controlling the hardware. Um, so what I'm going to do is now use both terminals that I have open, one the left being the Raspberry Pi and the right being my local computer. So what I did for that is wrote this. It's a little more complicated, but not, not too bad. Um, I wrote another module that exports some, some methods that I'm going to use. So it's going to be called, on the Raspberry Pi, I'm going to call this one called Start Light, which is actually down here at the bottom. And what that's going to do is basically kind of do what I just did. It's going to create the LED on that same pin and then store that PID that I get back in this variable. And then it, I'm going to, and this is, um, in order for the two devices to talk to each other, I have to register the, the light, the light process here. So that's going to register this um, name uh, so that when I actually am querying it, it'll be able to look up 
the, the light will reference the uh, actual uh, Erlang light process. It's kind of, I know it's kind of confusing, but just kind of, we'll get to there in a second. So, Swan returns a PID and associates PID with light? Uh, actually, that's a good question. I think so, but I have to look up what exactly register does to know that. But yeah, let's say that it does that, because I think that makes sense. All right, so it's going to spawn this other process uh, using that mod the same module that we're looking at, and it's going to call the light function, and it's going to pass in this PID that I created, so that the handle to that other, the thing that represents the LED. All right, so if we go back up to the light function, it accepts the LED pin, the PID, uh, and then it's going to do that same receive block. So what I've got is a little bit more complicated matchers here, so it's going to take in uh, again, this, this process is going to keep listening to its mailbox. It's going to receive, receive, receive. And it's going to look for these tuples. What, they're all going to start with switch, meaning that this is a message from the switch. Uh, it's going to pass in the switch PID. And then it's going to pass in, it's expe so the switch PID is a variable. And then it's, so that's going to be whatever the switch is, ends switch up being. Switch in that sense? Right in that line. Oh, so that's a, an atom. So it's like a symbol. So basically, it's my word. It's your word. I could, it could be foo. It, it could be anything. Like oh, switch, so yeah, that's that's a good point. It is a little confusing, but yeah, that could be anything. Basically, when it, when you're designing something that accepts messages, sometimes you want to be specific to like you know because you can any process in the Erlang if you've got like a hundred processes, they can all send messages to each other. Um, there's no like oh you can't talk to you and you know that kind of thing. So. A lot of times you come up with these conventions of like just using uh, matching. So you're basically trying to match the message. So Erlang is very good at that. It's very fast at matching. So basically, it's only going to listen. It's only going to acknowledge anything that starts off uh, with the, where the message starts with the word switch. You know, sort of in this structure. So it. Uh, so this here's the one that actually does the work. Um, so switch. It listens for that. It's going to take the PID and then what it's supposed to do. And then it's going to print out sort of, oh, okay, you know, I got the, the on message. The light received that message. And then it's going to fire that message, that same one, to the PID, like I did in the console just a second ago. And then it's going to send back a message to the switch, the one that is asking it to turn the light on, and be like, okay, I, I turned it on. And then it's going to call itself again. This is sort of part of the tail recursion, which I mentioned. This is a very common idiom in... Uh, in Erlang to have this sort of tail recursion. It's very efficient. It doesn't actually build up the stack. It's op Erlang is optimized that it's just always going to be single level stack call for this type of recursion. So we call back uh, light and we pass in the same PID because we're still listening on the same PID, the same light LED PID that we created. Um, and it's just going to repeat the process and just basically sit there until we get another message. All right. So uh, I'm not familiar with tail recursion, at least not by that name. And this Sure. Is it is it uh, can you get in that same looping kind of action elsewhere in that receive block? Or uh, there's you actually so it's in here it's here for all the ones where it kind of makes sense to return and wait. The other one that doesn't return is this one where I'd say just decouple the light from the switch. So I basically say shut down the system. You know. So, so any, this this does this do this? The entire time it's in receive mode, which is basically its entire life. Yeah. It's like a while loop. So they're all yeah. so you have all these these different processes sitting there spinning in these receive loops. There's some, yeah. It optimizes itself. It's optimized for that. Yeah. That's it. So well, yes. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Yeah. So essentially. Work. Yeah. Coming from like C or something. You okay. You like run out of memory and die, right? Well, it's, it's, it's sort of similar to like the Arduino, right? It just will sit there and you, just, you have your setup block and then your, what is the other main or whatever? Oh. I forget. Loop? Yeah, yeah, same thing. Loop and just sits there and runs through that, you know, after your setup. So, in, in like C, if you did it in C, like on a small computer, you'd spend all of your time spinning these different things and you'd never get anything done. And Erlang somehow manages to do that without choking. And presumably yeah. it doesn't actually, like if a thread isn't receiving a message. But with with Erlang, I'm assuming the thread isn't running unless it receives a message when it's in this loop. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. So it's probably optimizing it, away. It optimizes something. 
so that it doesn't crash. I don't know. I don't. I don't know it that well. Then you go into receive, and it says where my where's my message. Yeah, I. I, that's true. Actually, I've called receive sometimes accidentally with the wrong arguments, and it'll just hang there. So I'm assuming maybe it'll just wait at receive until it gets some message in the mailbox, and then do something with it. So. So in C, it would be like you would call instead of it's, it's almost like it's not recursion, right? It's like you're not spawning another instance and allocating stacks based yeah. everything. You're basically you've got a pointer to the function, and you're calling that pointer. Functional. So Functional programming language yeah. like this, when you see tail recursion, which that means the last thing you're doing is calling yourself, you're recursing, they'll just optimize it away and say, I know what this is. I'm not going to put it on the stack. It, it, it yeah, yeah. Out basically. It turns, if it's tail recursion, it turns it into a loop so it doesn't add to a stack. That makes sense. Because a lot of these languages don't have for loops or while loops. Well, that was going to mm -hmm. be my next question. Is well, is this, do you do this instead of loops? Like there is no while yeah, or for loops? Right. Yeah. 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 That's not uh, good There's no reason uh, to do that because you're reason the wrong language. Start, start uh. the view and check the stack, um, or check the process the pids. See how oh, there only be there'll only be one pid. They're not uh, real threads. They're not yeah. real processes. They're just kind of ephemeral things. Yeah. So this is like a bunch of little, this is like a bunch of little threads with while, with non-blocking while loops. Yeah, I guess you can think of that. That, that makes sense. Um, Okay. It's an abstraction layer, so you don't have to worry about all that. Right. Stuff, That's right? the idea, is that you don't have to worry about it. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, like I said, I'm still learning Erlang, so this is, these are all great questions. I don't have to go look them all up now. Um, and then I'm actually gi giving the same talk or very similar one at the Erlang meetup on this Thursday. So if you want to see more of the hardware side of things, and maybe I'll get asked more difficult questions from Erlang experts, uh, see me sweat. <laughs> Yeah, so I have some questions about Erlang. Yeah, actually, I can come back in two weeks and tell you all the. I'll ask them the questions you guys asked me, and then. <laughs> but ultimately, and again, to go back to the JVM because I keep getting confused about the kid process idea is that you're running it within the concept within the context of the Erlang shell, which is its own actual Unix process with a mm -hmm. kid, yeah. you know, bar, you know, the whole bit. So when we say processes, they're actually, as you said, light, super lightweight, totally within the context of this yep. one process. But presumably, it, uh, obviously, in and of itself, is multi-threaded within the context of the OS, so that it can handle all this stuff. You've got two terminal windows. But the no. benefits are that it's massively parallel. The thing that was actually That's one thing that I have a question about, though, because this board, uh, I don't know, the are probably only one core or something. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so is this is this if we want to create a cluster of Raspberry Pis, or what's the advantage of having something massively parallel on a single, on a board that can only run one thread of execution? Uh, well, so it's a good question. That's something I'm still trying to like have a really great answer for. But, but basically, you what did the answer right in front of you? You're talking about going between your laptop and the Pi. Yeah. yeah. And 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 Erlang handles all that. It does. So and that to, to your cluster of Pis. If you're running a program within Erlang, it's like they all, you create like, you're, theoretically, you're, you're doing like a mesh network where Erlang is handling all that low level plumbing. It's like, just distribute the work amongst all the nodes, right? Uh, I, you could do that, I suppose. Uh, yeah, that's how that works. Right. Are pretty distributed. Yeah, no. So I guess what I, what I, I've, I've just seen a couple talks on this as an idea. And I think the direction is like, you create for every thing you have hooked up to the Pi, let's say if you want to interface hardware, um, like uh, servos and sensors and LEDs and stuff, you would model each one of those devices as a separate process, right? And so that can kind of contain like whatever it is, the, the servo, the LED, whatever. And then you could construct your system on top of that to like build them together and say like, you know, compose those smaller things up into like, oh, this is actually a robot or this is, uh, you know, something in my house that controls when I water my plants or whatever it is. So then on top of that, you could build larger constructs, also in the same paradigm of having multiple processes that then just are sending simple messages to each other. Um, and then another benefit is that like, if one of the processes should crash or something becomes inconsistent, you can always restart very quickly and everything step back to the original state. Right? So it helps you avoid failure. So you can actually have processes that then monitor things and sending messages back and then restart them when they fail. I don't think it's, core. yeah, it's not really a, well, but it's a, it's a, a 
conceptual abstraction that allows you to have this kind of a mental boost. I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know what you mean. Yes, yeah, so a performance on this little thing. I'm not sure. I mean, well, like, like if you're controlling. Like, then it would you get a performance boost by running a functional program, which is stateless. Right. But if you only have one, you're not going to get a performance boost, but you kind of get a conceptual. It, it's leverage for your mind. Right. It's oh, yeah. a whole heck of a lot easier than yeah. writing threads. Exactly. <laughs> I, I like the idea that you know if I had a if I wrote robot controlling software and you're learning that, you know, my the thing that controls the arms went berserk, okay, I can shut that down mm -hmm. theoretically cleanly, so now I can just restart that process and it sort of reattaches so that now it can be receiving messages properly and I've, I've right. presumably recalibrated the actual physical hardware or whatever. Exactly. And then, you know, if you want to have a cluster of them that then communicate with each other and you can actually have the two robots send messages to each other over Erlang, over the Wi-Fi network. And all that, like, network plumbing and crap is, like, all abstracted away from you. So that makes it, so it is, I guess, yeah, cognitive efficiency. You save the headache of having to really deal with all that headache. Um, so you, you mentioned that there's no, nothing to prevent one process, like, one thread from sending messages to the other. Is that... As far as I know, yeah, I think you can, so you basically, if you have a PID, you can send any message to that PID, and it'll sit in the mailbox. So it's, it's like part of the idea behind, like, at least the, some of the design approaches is, like, failure is okay. Yeah. If you write a program that, um, you know, gets some garbage input and crashes, it, it, it spits that out, and then you can learn from that and improve it, and you make it more resilient next time. Like but the idea is it's supposed to just take it and fail and then restart and be like, okay, well, I don't know what that garbage was, but I'm going to just keep going on with what I need to do. It won't choke, you know? Um, and then there's a whole sets of, like, hierarchies you can build to kind of deal with getting messages you don't know about and then like, just hot code swapping. So in theory, you could then, like, swap in this new module that was better at handling those things without having to shut the system down, uh, which is also one of the neat benefits, which I have... I don't know how it would work on the Raspberry Pi. I've never actually done that. But it sounds really cool, right? You know, it's like... You can have this little robot and then just keep sending it more code and just sort of lives this there and lives and anyway. How does the module on the, on the laptop find the PID on the Raspberry Pi? Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to show that. Uh, that's next. Um, so, so what I uh, what I got set up and this will, I, we're trying to get out of here at nine, right? So let me finish up. Um, all right. So let me just let me quit this guy. All right, so on the Raspberry Pi, I have that same code I was going over just with you guys. And then also on my laptop, I got that same code, that same Erlang file. Um, net LE, oops, Erl, um, right? Uh, you have to compile Erlang, right? So Erlang code, if I want to compile, I just do net LED, Erl, and compiles. Um, and then you notice there's the beam, the beam file. That's what actually gets executed. So uh, I'm going to fire up my, uh, what I'm going to call the computer, the switch, right? So I'm going to fire up my switch, and I'm going to give it a name. Uh, I'm going to call it switch. This is, this is an important part of getting them to talk to each other, is starting the shell and giving it this name. So I'm going to call it the switch. And then, I'm gonna, can you guys see that? So you All just right. gave it the name switch? Uh, oh. Is that better? Or seeing? Okay. Oh, and I'll put that one down there. Um, you have bigger text? Yeah. Is the switch the name that you gave it? Uh, I'm almost. I'm, in the, I'm gonna finish the statement in one second. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, yeah, so switch and then uh, I have to give it the host. Um, so this machine is, oh, I wrote it down. So here's my host. Oops. Is it 110? No. I thought I'd type that. No, you type one and then you paste yeah. the rest. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so I'm going to fire that up. And you can see here now uh, in my little shell, it says you know the name of the node that I'm on. And I'm going to do the same thing. Let me swap that up here and this one down there. And there's only two. I'm <laughs> not. You hate software, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here I'll do the same thing. Um, I'm going to give it a name, and this is the light. And I'm going to say this light is, uh, what now, where are you guys? Uh, you're at this. 
So I've got it. Uh, the, them two. I got it connected via a crossover cable. Um, in case you're wondering, um, and I'm sharing the network through my Ethernet point on my my Mac. All right. So that's fired up. So now the Erlang shell on the Raspberry Pi is running. It's known to itself as light at that IP. So I'm going to call my my net LED library and say start. Oops, right. Start light. All right, and it's going to fire that off. It says, OK, true. So it's running. Um, so it is now listening. So now I'm going to go over here to, oh, I'm going to go up. So now it's, <laughs> the colors helps keep them in. I mean, does that work? Do the colors That's look OK? Right. OK. Don't listen to me. I'm, I'm an idiot. All right, so now I'm going to call net LED. All right, so let me go back to the code real quick and show you what I'm going to call. Um, so right now, the Raspberry Pi is kind of just sitting there in this light loop, this function that's just going to loop. And so I'm going to call. Uh, from my switch, the switch function. So I'm going to pass in the light node, which in this case is going to be like a string represents the IP and the name of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and then the action, what I want to do. So node is really a network node. Yeah, in this case it is. You, you're, not, you're not dependent on the fact that you call the individual nodes like switch back to your code, right? I mean, you could, could you have called it instead of switch, called it Foo or yeah, I could have called it foo. Or I just was trying to come up with a name that made sense. But yeah, I could use foo or bar or something. Yeah, it's just a parameter. Um, oh wait, I forgot what I was doing. Oh yeah, so now I got to type in the IP one nine two six eight dot two dot oops three. Oops. Uh, oh, and I need to tell it what to do. So why don't you turn on? Huh? And there it goes. So you can see. Ah, uh -huh, yes. Uh, you can see, uh, <laughs> all right, so it printed out switch receive. So, th so basically what happened was we got, it kind of went backwards, right? So the light printed out, so Raspberry, the Erlang shell printed out this. It said light received on, right? That was what the message it got. And then it, ret and then it turned the light on, and then it res replied to the switch uh, shell and said this, you know, what it received. So basically it sent that message back, so it received on. Um, so I can say, you know, go. Oh, I, could, I could say foo. And actually, it will say, I don't know what that is. Uh, it'll return an error. Um, well, the first time I typed in something wrong, it actually crashed. <laughs> so then I was like, hey, well, maybe I should put in a, you know, a catch statement that'll say, I don't know what this is. Uh, I don't see it says unknown command foo. Right? Defensive programming. That's, that's part, all, all part of Erlang. Um, so let's say, let's shut your light off. Right, there it is, off. Um, so that's turning off LED over the internet. There's like not much code, okay. basically just some little wiring and some conventions, and um, that's uh, that's the demo. All right, so back to the slides. Um, I presume you can do stuff like asynchronously, like send your like you know, send your remote command program, like start listening on Twitter or something like that. So there's are you like spawning and detaching a process? To, to do that? Like, if you, uh, there, like, yeah, well, so. Do you, do you have the concept of like callbacks? Like, you know, all, you know start listening on Twitter you can, and tell uh, me when you hear something about this morning. You can create that concept if you need it. But it's not, I mean, like I kind of did it with the code that I wrote where it was like it went and did something and then sent a message back. Right. You don't have to do that. Like, processes can just accept. And so if you need callbacks, you can kind of wire them in. But it's all, I mean, you, you kind of, that's sort of, a, then you're creating sort of a, uh, order dependency, which you may or may or may not want to introduce into your system. I'm just thinking, like, because if you're a long running process, or, I'm sorry, well, yeah, I guess a process, you're, you're, if you invoked it from your laptop, it wouldn't return until obviously the, the process on the Pi returns. So mm -hmm. the idea is, you know, do something so that I can continue sending commands and let it handle all this other mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so if you guys want to play around with it, um, Erlang. One question. Oh, sure. I, I, if you, uh, I mean, I'm just going to. In the code that's running on the laptop that's talking to the Pi, you have uh, your, your uh, switch that they received that has like uh, four switch statements. Mm -hmm. could, you add, could you add another one that toggles the LED? And then just let it spaz out. 
and just see how fast it'll go. See how fast. Oh. See how fast uh, the, the LED. Like if yeah, it, we could try that after. You want to do that? If, if the LED is off, then turn it on, and if it's on, then turn it off. Yeah. I'm wondering how fast it goes. I want to. I want to. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. I'm on it. Because yeah, well, so that's, it's possible, yeah, that's like, question. that was actually something that the, they were talking about in Erlang Embedded is like, maybe, maybe we should have some, like, constraints around, like, how fast you can toggle your LEDs, because hardware is not going to be able to handle it. I so that's, I can see it. That's, okay, that's we can try it. Uh, well, it's actually just a cube of uh, glue, uh, uh, hot glue. I made a bunch of LEDs that I embedded in these. I wanted to make some kind of squarish light. You put a question mark on it next time. Oh, okay. Well, so, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, All right. Wait, I just wanted to show, okay. Oh, I wasn't done. Wait, hold on. I got to just have one, two, just two seconds. All right. Uh, if you want to want to do it, do your Erl own Erlang on the uh, Raspberry Pi. Use Raspbian. It's really simple. You just add the package, uh, and then if you just look up Erlang embedded, dot Erlang. No crap. Embe uh, crap. Yeah. Where is it? Here. Erlang dash embedded, um, or go here. Uh, they have like just really simple instructions. You basically just add the source to your. Um, App sources list, and then just do install uh, or ESL or yeah ESL Erlang. I don't know what this, what they what they did, but it works great. Um, it's super easy, and um, yeah, other resources. These books are good. Erlang programming, I recommend this one. Is and the then the kangaroo one better than the squirrel. Uh, the squirrel is a good intro book, so I guess it depends. I don't know. You should definitely start with the squirrel if, if you're new to Erlang. It's a new one. Yeah. What was that? Yeah, try. so I spent a lot of time trying to get it run on the BeagleBone. There's a project called the Neves Project, which was done like a year ago, and I followed that instruction to create the flashed uh, card, and it just kind of bricked my, not bricked, I mean just like just hung there, didn't do it, I sat there and didn't do anything. So I'm going to have to play around with build root or BitBake, and I don't know how to do either of those things, so I'm just like, they look really complicated, but there are recipes, and I guess that's BitBake terminology for building Erlang cross-compiling. Because I tried compiling it on the BeagleBone, and there's like crazy dependencies, and, and that was a headache. That took me like all of Saturday of just like, you know, and it's slow, right? I mean, it's compiling on the device is not the best use of your time. Um, so a bit fake, but hopefully there'll be some resources in the next few months that will make it super easy to get on the BeagleBone. But I, I definitely, that's my goal is to get it on there. How come you couldn't just add, get install with applet? Uh, because of the ARM instructions, and it's sort of a, 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 there's some things that just won't work that are part of the normal library. So they, they sort of slim down. Yeah, something like that. So this runs on right now on, for you, runs on Raspbian? Yeah, it works great on Raspbian, on the Raspberry Pi. BeagleBone is on. A, as, uh, I put Angstrom on there. Yeah, maybe if I was, maybe that's. I could try that. But the ar but the architecture would be. I don't know if they have builds for that architecture. That's the thing. Well, right? uh, the the V7 could run anything that was V6, I believe. Oh, okay. The Pi is the old one. Oh, okay. But it's with the distros and stuff. If you're trying to find the package for Angstrom, yeah, I mean, who knows? But, right. like, but you could. Do Debian, could do other right, maybe I'll try that. That's a good idea. I okay. have one last question. Where is the meetup that you mentioned? Oh, uh, so it's this Thursday at 1871, which is uh, in the Merchandise Mart. Oh, you think it starts at 7? But there's a, uh, if you go to meetup.com, there's the Chicago Erlang Meetup, or Chicago Erlang User Group, C-E-U-G. Um, and then actually in July, uh, Joe Armstrong, the creator of Erlang, is going to be presenting there. So. Wow. So that would be a good one to catch if you're interested in seeing the man himself. Can you hear me, Joe? Can you hear me, man? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, uh, long time. Play the video. You know, <laughs> you, uh, uh, um, okay. oh, I should have gone to the Wikipedia page. Um, I wonder, I guess I can show the video. Let's see. 86. If you haven't seen the video, it's, 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 you should check it out. Just Google, uh, search for Erlang on YouTube. It's, it's like Erlang the movie, oh yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, it's only 11 minutes. 
Th so that's Joe Armstrong when he and they did this like it's kind of funny and then is that was that verding something I don't know so they talk about Erlang and like the switches and just kind of keep jumping ahead and sort of early versions of things and there's one point where they make a phone call which is really funny yeah. right now <laughs> yeah and it's like powered by Erlang or something and there's this funny banter over <laughs> it's like cheesy like corporate video from the 80s you know. <laughs> Worth watching if you have like you know eleven sure. minutes to kill. The Swedish are not immune to this type of video. <laughs> I think it was like a remix version, probably. I don't know. <laughs> they definitely did one where uh, I think it was they used. Oh man, what was it? Um, no, what was it? I feel like there was definitely a. Yes. Oh crap. Um, there's also in Coders at Work, there's one of the chapters is Joe Armstrong. Coders at Work is a really cool book, and one of the chapters is interviews with programmers. One of the chapters is Joe Armstrong. So I'm sure they'll give you a lot of the historical background. Oh, no, that's not it. Okay, that's it. All right, thank you.